Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Scott Glassens. He is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Auckland. He studies the biological and cultural evolution of human cooperation and uses methods from experimental economics and evolutionary game theory to shed light on how and why we give to others. So, Dr. Glassens, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to everyone. Thank you, Ricardo. Yeah, I've been a big fan of this podcast for a while, so I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you. So uh, let's start then by talking about cooperation. So we as humans seem to be very cooperative, sometimes I guess even exceptionally cooperative when in comparison to other animal species. So why is it like that? Why is that? That's a, that's a, a big question. <laughs> Maybe one of the biggest questions facing, facing the social sciences uh, at, at the moment. And it's definitely the question that drives uh, my research. Yeah, as you said, we are exceptionally cooperative. Um, what do I mean by cooperative behavior? Um, it's, the general definition of cooperative behavior is uh, providing a benefit to another individual, sometimes at a cost mm. to yourself. Um, and and we see this you, you just walk outside and you see this in in human societies right we we open the doors for one another we we will give to charity we you know uh, give others rides to the airport and things yeah. uh, you know these these behaviors are really common um and so common that the question becomes well why in in some respects evolutionary theory doesn't really predict um cooperative behavior uh, you, you, I mean, the classic definition of the kind of survival of the fittest and nature red in tooth and claw, you know, it's, it's, it's competition out there. And if you're the one that's, that's giving to others, you're not going to succeed as, as well as other individuals. That's the, the story. And, but the, over the, over the past, um, I guess, century or so of research, um, we've been trying to uh, find evolutionary explanations for why people might be um, cooperative. And uh, I guess one thing to make clear is that when we're talking about these why questions for human mm. behavior, we've got to separate proximate from ultimate explanations. Mm. I think there's an important distinction there. You, other yeah. people might have talked about this yeah. in the podcast. So um, proximate explanations being more kind of mechanistic, like, um, you know, so why are people cooperative? Well, because they... Uh, it makes them feel good or because they see others in need and they feel compassion and empathy and and they might get a, a kind of warm, fuzzy feeling, sometimes called a warm glow from helping others. That's that's a kind of mechanistic explanation. And I guess what I study probably more is ultimate explanations for um, cooperative behavior. So the, the um, evolutionary function of the behavior, like why might people, why would it be in someone's fitness interests um, to be cooperative in the first place? So we can focus on those. And there's a whole class of explanations that we might get into um, as the interview goes on. Yeah, right. But, but then what are some of those ultimate explanations then? Yeah, there's, there's a whole host. Um, so one that I've studied um, a fair amount is is reputational benefits that come from being cooperative. So um, you might have heard uh, there's a, a famous Native American uh, group where they have these um, these large uh, feasts called potlatches. And they're these huge feasts where they give out loads of food and bags of flour to everyone who who comes along and um and and it's kind of this show right it's the show of of status and uh, wealth um and so it's this idea that the cooperation in this case the cooperative behavior being giving away these things can be a signal it can be a signal to others of um features uh, of of yourself that are unobservable or would otherwise be unobservable so um, yeah, they can be signals of status and wealth, because if you if you w weren't a very wealthy person, you wouldn't be able to give away all that stuff. Right. Mm. Um, and so it can it can be a, a signal. And I've studied a little bit of that in my own research. Mm -hmm. uh, so but uh, it's one thing to be cooperative, but 
we also seem to get some benefits from being seen to be cooperative. That is, people seem to like cooperative people. So what kinds of benefits do we gain from that? Yeah, yeah. I think this is related to the one possible function of cooperative behavior being a signaling function. Mm -hmm. um, in that when people see us being nice, you know, if people see that I am a generous person, um, that I give to charity, that I, um, you know, help others when they're in need, that mm -hmm. that boosts my reputation, right? I mm -hmm. now get a, re especially if uh, I think that I can't be seen. Right. If like yeah. someone finds out that I donated anonymously to charity, they're like, well, he must be a really good guy because he wasn't even doing it for reputational benefits. Right. Um, so so being seen to be cooperative can be really useful to individuals in order to to gain a bunch of things. One might be um, social partnerships. So um, if I have a good reputation as a really nice guy, others are going to be more likely to work with me in kind of shared endeavors because they know mm -hmm. that I'm not going to like you know, run away with the money as soon as, um, <laughs> as soon as I can. Yeah. So it kind of builds up this, this trust. And then you end up having this kind of rich network of social relationships. So you can kind of benefit indirectly through that. Um, one example that I like to use is there's some research in um, Matu hunters in Australia. Yeah. And there's some research showing that the individuals in the camps who are more generous with the, the meat that they've collected from um, from their hunting. If yeah. they're more generous from the meat, they're more central in social networks. Um, and so it's kind of it's kind of a nice uh, nice way of showing that if you if you're if you're good and you're seen to be good, then it can uh, it can help you in social partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, in your work, I read about this cooperative phenotype. Uh, what is it? Mm. Yeah, the, the cooperative phenotype is a term that was coined by uh, David Rand and colleagues. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I've been talking so far about how there are certain um, situations that might make people more cooperative. For example, like if, you're, if your behavior is observable, you know, your reputation's on the line, so you're more likely to be, ge be a generous person. Those are things that will just tend to make everyone across the board more cooperative. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in... Uh, in neutral situations, we tend to find that there are even differences between people. So some people just tend to be more cooperative. They tend to be more generous, more pro-social in all these different ways. And some people just tend to be less so. Yeah. Um, and the way that this has been studied is by using um, economic games. I don't know if, if anyone has covered the, these topics on the podcast before. Uh, I'll just yeah, I've, describe I've what economic games. Yeah, I've talked a little bit about uh, game theory and economic games on the show with yep. several people. But yeah, please give us a recap or a brief summary of it. Yeah, yeah. So just for those who, who don't know, economic games are often used to, um, to measure cooperative preferences. So uh, one, one game is the dictator game. Um, someone is given a certain amount of money, so say like $10.00. And they're told, okay, you're going to be partnered with someone else and you can give any of that amount or, or none of it, any of that amount to the other person. Yeah. And so it's just a one way transaction. And then you measure kind of how generous they are. And there's lots of different variations of economic games. So there's uh, the trust game, the public goods game, lots of different games. And what you tend to find when you measure the same person across the dictator game, the trust game, the public goods game, all these different games, that there are correlations. That, that someone who is generous in one game tends to also be generous in, in another game. And there's some work showing that this relates to um, actual pro-sociality pro in the real world. So it suggests that there are some personality differences or phenotypic differences between people uh, in terms of how much they're, they're willing to be cooperative. And do we know where those differences stem from? I mean, you mentioned personality there, for example. Does it correlate with any specific personality traits, for example? Yeah, so um, some of the work has linked it with personality. I think we find uh, agreeableness. So there's the big five personality mm -hmm. Um, and agreeableness is the trait that seems to be related to the cooperative phenotype. 
and also honesty, humility as well, those kind of personality traits. But uh, I think the the, the research really is uh, still being done on that. Um, th there is a bunch of work in uh, in experimental economics showing that uh, behavior in these games actually seems to have um, some genetic basis. There's some heritability to the, yeah. those behaviors, which is really interesting. Uh, but that will only be a, sh a small portion, and and there could be it could be upbringing. There could be a host, whole host of reasons why people people vary. Yeah. Right. Uh, and does prosociality vary across societies? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we've been talking about the cooperative phenotype and how there's prosociality varying uh, across individuals. But, you know, when you look around the world, you do see a fair amount of variation in um, prosocial behavior. It obviously depends what you're measuring. There's so many different kinds of prosocial behavior. Um, if I recall correctly, from a study that we recently did, when you look at something, something like charitable giving, uh, questions around altruism and charitable giving, you find that um, Mexico is on the lower end, and then Egypt was uh, was the highest. So mm -hmm. there, there seem there does seem to be variation, um, obviously depending on what you measure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is there any particular explanation for that, or are there competing explanations for for that? Yeah, um, I'm not sure to be honest. Uh, I, I think that the so I think we're at the stage of research where we we've started to kind of map these things out. So um, there was this great data set that came out a couple of years ago now called the Global Preferences Survey, and mm -hmm. they are they asked people questions similar to the dictator game that I was mentioning earlier. They do stuff like that, but they're survey questions yeah. around the whole world. And so we're starting to like see these differences, but I think really the reasons for those differences are still still being explored. It's going to take, you know, a, a, a bunch of different kind of cross-cultural studies to really understand what's going there. I mean, I could see it being related to the particular political institutions in the country, um, the kind of cultural history that they have and the, the strength of social norms and the strength of markets. There could be a whole host of reasons, yeah. Mm -hmm. But is pro-sociality related in any way to partner choice? Mm. Yeah, so this links to some recent work that we've done looking around the world at pro-sociality uh, around the world. I'll just back up again and say, so earlier we were talking about reputation mm -hmm. right, and how yeah. uh, it can be useful to be cooperative because if others see you being cooperative, then it can be good to generate new partnerships. Yeah. But obviously that's worthless if relationships are kind of fixed. Like in some societies in the world, it's relatively difficult to change who you who you are um, who you have relationships with, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're just kind of stuck in, in those yeah. partnerships. Whereas in other societies, it might be the case that relationships are more fluid, and you can, you know, if someone screws you over, you can leave them behind and go and you know and hang out with someone else. So, um, socio ecologists have started referring to this as relational mobility. Mm -hmm. So the degree to which relationships and societies are fluid um, as opposed to fixed. And so because of this, this theory about reputation uh, and, and um, choosing new partnerships as, as a driver of cooperative behavior, we wanted to see if countries around the world that had high relational mobility, in other words, you can uh, freely choose your partnerships, uh, if they were more cooperative uh, than uh, societies where uh, where relational mobility is lower. And so that was the the theory. And so we went in and we we wanted to be good scientists. You know, we this comes from theory. So we pre-registered a hypothesis and we say, OK, well, look, well, we think that we're going to find that um, maybe it is that Egypt is particularly high because they are, you know, they have high relational mobility. So we had these predictions, but we looked across two different data sets um, with a fair number of countries. I think we looked at like 30 to 40 countries mm -hmm. um, and we just didn't, we didn't find any relationships there. So we didn't find that um, relational mobility was related to various measures of, of cooperative behavior. So um, altruistic kind of charitable giving, but also um, 
reciprocal giving and uh, gift giving and lots of different things. And yeah, across all of them, we didn't really find a relationship. So that's interesting. Yeah, but if there would have been a relationship, uh, what would it be? Uh, what were you expecting to find? I mean, was it that higher relational mobility would supposedly predict um, more prosociality or the opposite? Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. So, yeah, we were predicting that um, in higher relational mobility societies, you would see more um more of this cooperative behavior so the the gift giving and the altruism and all these different things um but yeah that's that's just not what we found and it's it's difficult to know what that means right i don't think that means that we have to throw away the partner choice theory um it could just be that um in societies where relationships are relatively fixed there might just be other ways by which they um, encourage pro-social behavior among the people. Um, so it could be that they have really strict social norms, for example, and, um, and actually that's what's driving pro-social behavior in those places. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's the last word on the theory, but still, um, an interesting finding. Right. Uh, in a related topic, what are need based transfer systems? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, talk, I talked at the start a bit about how cooperative we are, uh, and often that is shown through giving to others in need, right? Mm -hmm. If you see someone on the street and they're, and they're desperately in need, you feel a compulsion to go over and, and help them, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you, so you've spoken to Athena Actopus and mm -hmm. Lee Kronk, I believe, right? Yeah. yeah. So they, um, they've studied this a lot, and... Uh, and I, I was lucky enough to go and work with them a few years ago on this. Um, they have a, a group called the Human Generosity Project who looks all around the world. And what they found time and time again is that this need-based giving is not just a, it's not just a Western thing. You find it in societies all over the world. Um, one particular society that uh, is kind of the canonical example of this is uh, the Maasai in East Africa. They have this system of need-based giving um, that seems unrelated to uh, getting directly paid back. So the Maasai are pastoralists. Uh, they, they depend on their herds of cattle in order to survive. But East Africa is a very challenging environment, a very volatile environment. And so it might be that one year, if you're a, a herder, that you lose half your herd for some reason and you're screwed. Um, they have these interesting relationships that last for many, many years called ossatoire relationships. And uh, how these relationships work is they just say, look, I, I'm desperately in need. Can you help me? And the, mm -hmm. the other person is obliged to, if they can help you, to give you what you need with no expectation of repayment. So it's not like there's a kind of debt credit system going on in this society. It's just purely based on, on need. Um, and this is really interesting because... Um, you know, for so long, the theories of cooperation and uh, evolutionary sciences were about reciprocity, right? You give something and then you get something in return, whereas this seems a bit different. And it's not just the Maasai, we see it all around the world as well. Mm -hmm. But are there particular uh, contexts, like, for example, ecological contexts where need-based transfer systems work best? Mm. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, a lot of the work in the Human Generosity Project has been trying to nail down exactly what those ecological um, conditions are. So I mentioned uh, the volatile ecology of um, mm. the East African savanna. That's one case where, um, where it could be really useful to have this kind of need-based sharing system. So um, if, something, if something bad happens to me um, because of like drought or disease or theft or something yeah. um someone else who you know lives over the way who hasn't been affected by the same uh by the same ailment mm -hmm. they can come to my to my aid so you need you you need a volatile environment but also uh, something where there's asymmetric um risk so you know if i'm over here and you're over there and we both get hit by the same drought we're not going to be able to help each other out right we're both mm -hmm. screwed um, so that there needs to be this kind of volatility, but also this asymmetry in order for these relationships to be uh, useful.
Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you now a couple of questions about religiosity. So, uh, when it comes to the relationship between religiosity and prosociality, I've already talked with, with several people on the show about this and the evidence seems to be conflicted or at least people tell me that we're still not sure about the directional uh, the direction of causality here uh, i mean if it's uh, if religion really uh, causes prosociality or uh, increases prosociality or if it's the other way around for example so what do you know about the topic is is it really the case that being more religious turns people more pro-social or not mm. yeah i think it's a it's a really tough topic um i haven't done any work on this myself but from what i've seen so i know that there were a bunch of uh, experiments priming experiments for example mm. where you you prime people with religious terms, God, heaven, things like that. And then and yeah. then you give them one of these tasks that I was talking about, so like the dictator game. And then you find that people who are primed give more in the game. So that's a kind of interesting yeah. finding. But I think that people have had some trouble replicating that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know to what extent it holds up. Um, aside from those experimental findings, I generally find the story around... Um, the link between religion and cooperation quite compelling. Um, like if you if you look at religious systems, they do have a lot of norms and systems in place to encourage cooperation. And you know, yeah. there's a bunch of examples from different um, major religions around the world. So I find the story compelling. I'm not sure exactly where the evidence is at, um, but yeah, it's going to be a fruitful area for research over the next couple of decades, I think. Mm -hmm. And what about the relationship between religiosity and well-being? Is there one or are we mm. not sure about that? Yeah, yeah. We uh, we recently did some work on this as well. Um, so, you know, people have asked the question about mm -hmm. whether religious people are happier uh, mm -hmm. for a while. Um, but there hasn't been good cross-cultural data in order to get at that question because you need to look all around the world, right? Isn't it? You can't just get looking at um, Christian people in Western populations. You need to uh, be quite general about it. And um, and so we recently participated in a in a in an interesting project. It was a kind of uh, it was a, a new scientific uh, kind of uh, yeah way of doing things that I've not experienced before. The, the way it worked was uh, we had many analysts. So they 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 had this this really cool data set on religiosity and well-being all around the world. Um, but they wanted to know, okay, we could just analyze this ourselves and we could find out the relationship. But what if we give loads of different teams this same data set and see what they all independently come up with? And uh, this is interesting because there's actually a bunch of variation in the different techniques that researchers will use, the different kind of correlations they find. Um, and, and so you do find a, a bunch of variation in, when you do this, this kind of many analysts thing. Um, in this case, I think basically every single team, there, there would have been like 100 teams, mm -hmm. um, every single team found a positive relationship between religiosity and well-being. Um, so I, you know, I think that that's pretty um, that's pretty conclusive. <laughs> um, we did we did some work looking to see how it varied around the world, and I think we found in most of the most of the countries that were included in the data set, we found a positive relationship between religiosity and well-being. Um, so you know, I think it's a fairly robust uh, effect. Mm -hmm. So I have one more question I would like to ask you that uh, that is a more, sort of a more methodological one. Uh, and mm -hmm. I've already talked with several people on the show about uh, issues and things that people have to be careful about and keep in mind when they do, for example, cross-cultural or cross-national uh, studies about different 
cultural phenomena and traits that vary cross-nationally or cross-culturally, for example. So what is non-independence in cross-national analysis? Yeah, <clears throat> non-independence is a problem. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a statistical issue. So I mentioned before we did this, we did this study where we were looking at relational mobility around the world. Yeah. Um, and we were very careful to control for non-independence. So what is non-independence? Well, when you do a study of individuals, you're kind of randomly sampling people from a population right mm -hmm. um so i get you know however many participants in my study and then and then i do an analysis on that um so that is kind of independent draws from a population but if you think of countries around the world they they really aren't independent of one another mm. um so some countries are closer than others um so if we think of like european countries they're kind of all clustered together and so they might experience similar ecological or climate based um, factors, which might mm. make them more similar, even if that's unrelated to what you're interested in studying, right? Um, similarly, you can think of um, countries might be really culturally similar. So, uh, if, you know, if we think of New Zealand and the UK, right? They're, they're very, very far apart, but actually they share kind of a cultural heritage because of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And so they share a lot of things in common. Now it's not, it might not be because of what you're interested in studying, but just because of that history. And so um, what researchers have started to do is to control for this in various, in various ways in the analyses. Um, and actually what I found is that when you do account for these things, the associations that you get across countries can be very different. And so, yeah, it's worth doing. I think if you're any cross national researchers out there, you should take this very seriously. Uh, but, but I mean, uh, just uh, a follow up to that. So uh, this issue of non-independence, you mentioned several different aspects in which uh, different countries, for, uh, since we're talking about that here, uh, can be similar or different on, like, for example, ecological factors and uh, culture. So uh, the kinds of things you focus on to deal with non-independence, doesn't it depend on the topic you're exploring? Because, I mean, it could be that, for example, I don't know, just to give a sort of random example, that uh, ecological conditions between Norway and Sweden would be, I guess, more or less the same. But when it comes to uh, cultural factors, there would be some relevant differences there, right? So does, doesn't it, I, I mean, am I thinking correctly here? Doesn't it depend on the specific topic you're studying that you have to take this issue more or less? into account yeah i think so i, I think ideally because what the what the issue of non-independence really is is it's a it's a question of how you try to make causal claims with in this case co cross-country data so yeah. um you want to be able to say okay i have these two variables across countries and i want to show that they're related but also that one might be able to cause the other um yeah. Now, if there's common factors that are explaining both, so cultural history or ecology or whatever, mm -hmm. then that puts that cause, potential causal relationship at risk. It might just be spurious, right? So I think where we should be moving with cross-cultural work is to develop, okay, so I have a specific, these specific variables that I'm interested in um, based on a theory. And so I'm going to develop a kind of causal model of what I think uh, has caused uh, variation around the world and that will inevitably involve some kind of cultural relationships between countries and because they are they are so interlinked um, but you're right that exactly what you control for and how it's got to be dependent on the the exact question yeah mm -hmm. okay so uh, just before we go would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet yeah 
Um, yeah, I, I used to be very uh, active on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> I think since the Musk takeover, I've moved a little bit away from Twitter. I am on Mastodon, if anyone out there is on Mastodon. Um, but otherwise, yeah, just um, uh, on Google Scholar, I guess, and, and just keeping up with stuff there. I also do have a personal website, if, if anyone wants to check that out. Scott Classen's dot github dot something <laughs> just google me and i'm sure you'll find it okay great so thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show it's been a pleasure to talk to you yeah thank you ricardo and good luck with the podcast going forward this is a i'm what you're like 500 and something episodes crazy Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description box of this interview. And if you like this interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzka and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Herbert Gintis, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan the Matthew, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, George Pinha, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andrea, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Harl Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, John Nyers, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hummel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladez, Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Danners Mani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stasevski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentin, João Barbaro, Bosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Doug, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzka, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morten Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, Georgios Theophanes, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, João Barbosa, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herrigman, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracies, Tom Roth, D. RPMD and Eager N. And special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafinia, Tom Vanagdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Belnick Miller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Alni Cortiz, and to my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.